great. So what? Whoop. So I, we're live. Okay, great. Well, let me begin and welcome all of you to this is the Careers in Global Development at CSIS. We've been doing this for a number of years. And our guest today is Ambassador Pat Haslick, who I think if you've read her bio, it's full of stuff that's too complicated <laughs> <laughs> and too long to uh, repeat. But she was most recently the Acting Assistant Secretary of State for Economic and Business Affairs. She's an ambassador to Ethiopia, to Laos, to APEC. She was the deputy coordinator, my colleague, on Feed the Future. Uh, she spent a lot of time in different places, the Middle East. You were a coordinator in Afghanistan, er, in Iraq, and, and, Afghanistan. and the PDAS in Iraq at one point. Yeah, yeah. And, and I uh, worked for Rick Barton. Yeah, who actually, this is kind of an interesting time. Rick Barton, who is the Assistant Secretary of State, is coming in. And Pat's going to speak a little bit, but then we might invite Rick up here to talk about careers and that sort of thing in a little bit. So you get two for one here, mm -hmm. just before Memorial Day. So it's, it's kind of an interesting time. But Pat's going to talk a bit about her career yeah. and the trends that are going on right now and offer a little bit of career advice. And then we'll open it up to question and answers. And Rick will at that point come up and stand by the Great. podium. Great. And then you guys can, I'm off the hook. I just uh, sit and watch and you guys talk about questions. So without further ado, Ambassador Hannah. Pat, well, first of all, it's great to be here. And is that Tony Wayne who's also coming in? It's, it's, it's like unfair that... Oh, we can invite <laughs> that, him to write goodness, a critique. My goodness. And Tony, well, welcome. Come on in. Can we also introduce them as well? Yes. Yeah. Ambassador Tony Wayne, Ambassador Argentina, yeah. Ambassador Mexico, and Assistant Secretary for Economic also, and Business Affairs. Yes, and some also years ago. Uh, a colleague of mine who worked with me in Foreign Commercial Service in uh -huh. Ethiopia from, is also here. Oh, yeah. So you've... Uh, uh, oh, well, and the interesting thing I have to start out with, which I find fascinating, is she started out, started out at the Department of Agriculture. Right, I started out. Too. Not in the Foreign Service. Right. So one of the things you see sort of consistent when we talk about careers is this is not what I had intended. Well, there is a rhyme and reason uh, behind it. In fact, my card says uh, when I uh, retired at the end of November, I had put on the card an advocate for trade and development because basically... I've gone back and forth working on trade and development. And my last job as acting assistant secretary slash PDAS in the Economic and Commercial Bureau at the State Department, actually that's the bureau at the State Department that engages also on development issues uh, with USAID, works with the World Bank and, and others. So there is, there is a rhyme and reason here. In fact, my first job uh, with the government was with the Foreign Agricultural Service and I worked on the big drought in Ethiopia and Sudan. And then fast forward, uh, Ambassador Garvelink and I were colleagues working on what was called uh, the Feed the Future initiative under um, Secretary Clinton. And then my last ambassador assignment was in Ethiopia. And yet again, Ethiopia was at this time facing the worst drought in 50 years. But the way, because of all of the development assistance and all the work we had done because of Feed the Future, uh, we could see a significant difference in the way they were able to deal with that drought. In fact, it did not become a famine, and we weren't seeing on television horrible pictures of children dying, et cetera. So there is, there is a rhyme and a reason to this, <laughs> to this story. But I thought before, I, and I'm happy to talk about my career, but I'm actually um, very interested in talking about what's now happening, and I call them I call these, uh, these issues the global challenges. Um, my friends in Britain call them uh, the wicked problems. And when I was at graduate school, um, I was one of the first students to specialize in something called political economy. Because when many, many years back, when you went to undergraduate and graduate school and you studied political science or international affairs, in fact, international affairs was a, was a new, pretty much a new field, uh, people were very much stovepiped. And the State Department was a actually the same way. You came into the State Department and you were combed. It was sort of an obnoxious term, <laughs> yes. but you were coned a political officer, an econ officer, a consular officer, or a management officer, or you worked in the public diplomacy area. Well, in fact, your jobs and our jobs nowadays, and to address what we call the wicked challenges, in fact, require skills 
and interaction uh, across the different specializations, if, if you want to call them that. And when I was uh, working uh, for Secretary Clinton, she launched something called the QDDR, I think you're all quadrennial um, uh, diplomacy and development uh, uh, agenda, review it was called. And in fact, it, they came up with the term whole of government because you really can't separate uh, you know, the political from the economic or development, uh, all these uh, security, all of these issues actually uh, intersect with each other. So you really need to be able to not necessarily yourself be a specialist in every field, uh, Bill, uh, you know, works very much in the health area. Uh, as an ambassador, you know, you're going to encounter health challenges. You're going to encounter development challenges. You're going to encounter uh, um, economic challenges. So I think the goal is to, is to understand and develop solutions to the global challenges and then to be an en engine uh, for change and reform and addressing what I like to call the wicked problems, their poverty, their gender, their environment, their issues related to telecommunications and IT, food, food insecurity, disease, you can, you can go down the list. Um, and I think the, the goal is to become a bridge to, to government and, and among your colleagues in government, but then also to the outside. And that includes, when we talk about careers in international affairs, that includes uh, working with uh, the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, uh, NGOs, uh, involved, getting involved with academics and think tanks like uh, CSIS, all criti crit critically important. Um, because the most interesting challenges don't fit neatly into the confines of, of academic study. Um, and I, I don't know if any of you had the opportunity to read uh, Peter Schrunk's book, Why Governments Fail. I think that pretty much tells you uh, what the problem is when people are so stovepipe. So it's, it's also, um, and I'm gonna come back to this theme, critically important that you understand history, the context, and the, cult the cultures uh, where you're working. Um, a lot of focus now is on uh, digital platforms, and I do believe they're ideal co for connecting, but again, I do not think that they are the solution be uh, alone because learning, in fact, and engaging and solving these problems, in fact, is, is, is a social. It's critical that you have the social aspects to this. And I really do think, looking out, and I'm going to call you young people, uh, <laughs> that we call you the we generation, and in fact, I think you're the most accomplished generation at productive collaboration. I was recently um, in London uh, interviewing for a job and I went into this sort of open space and I felt like I was in Silicon Valley and you know, where are the desks and where are the, there's a coffee machine and, and uh, there, were, there were no set office spaces and I was a little, I, was, I have to tell you, I was a little uncomfortable <laughs> with this environment, so. Um, but you know, you could see the collaboration going on, so I really do feel that in fact, uh, this is key. Um, I think we also need to connect theory with policy. We need to start to provide maps to make sense and to anticipate the results of our policy decisions. I think we're too quick to jump into thinking that we have the answers to all the problems out there. Um, and I, I sort of specialized on the economic side, uh, but I'll tell you, I never learned anything in graduate school that was really useful with regard to actually practicing <laughs> economic work. And I'll give you an example, negotiating a, a, a trade agreement. Nego negotiating a climate <laughs> accord. These are not things that you learn in school. So I do encourage you, if you get an opportunity, at internships or things like that, to sign yourself up to work on um, some of these, uh, these types of uh, agreements. Um, again, I, I do think you, you need a strong study of history. I do feel uh, you know, we, we are facing a lot of challenges right now with sort of denial of history, uh, sort of all this issues of fake news and whatever, um, but uh, as Churchill said, the, the longer you can look back, uh, the farther you can look forward. So um, that is something I highly recommend. I don't know if you're in school or, I mean, I, I consider you know, studying a, a lifelong uh, pleasure, so it, it's not necessarily uh, just when you're in school. 
I would also say from my, the, all of the work that I did uh, in the conflict and stabilization world with uh, Ambassador Barton um, and wor the work I did, and I think Tony, Ambassador Wayne would agree, in areas like Afghanistan and Iraq, which we were all involved in. Uh, and this is something that we learned, uh, I have to say, from the military. And you need a strategy. You need a plan. You need an, an idea of how the actors and the trends and the problems fit together. And I come back to the Quadrennial Diplomacy and Development Review. In fact, I'm quoting from the report, which first came out in 2009, it was a blueprint for addressing U.S. interests in global security, inclusive economic growth, climate change, accountable governance, and freedom for all. And two of the initiatives that came out of that uh, were the uh, food security or the Feed the Future initiative, uh, by the way, which uh, Congress happens to love, uh, and yes. we've been able to get uh, continued funding for that, and the Global, the global Health Initiative, and, and that again, in many ways, it is to build the infrastructure in countries like Sierra Leone and Liberia and others, so that they can be coping with uh, issues like Ebola, avian yes. influenza, et cetera. So, um, I think you have to also av avoid and resist becoming an in incubator of conformity uh, by taking an independent and critical look at contemporary issues and what is working and what is failing. And the, everybody loves the success, but sometimes the failure is what's critically important. Um, and uh, I watched uh, on uh, public TV uh, PBS, a very interesting segment, and it was, uh, there were a group of Columbia University Presbyterian medical students who were taking a course that was being conducted by a conductor, uh, Roger Nuremberg, it's called the Music Paradigm. And what he did was he taught this, he brought the orchestra there and he, he, he showed when the different parts of the orchestra were not working together, all the disharmony and it wasn't wasn't beautiful music and it w I thought it was it was sort of a brilliant way to illustrate the need for collaboration and what wa working across uh, working with different instruments made instruments in that case um, and I would say the focus should be doing uh, should be on doing the right thing not just doing things right I think we get very uh, caught up in the process. Uh, and we, we sometimes lose sight uh, to what we, we, what we should be doing. Um, and um, the other is communication, and I think we've definitely lost this, and unfortunately, right now, the political environment. Uh, disagreeing well and listening well. These are, these are skills. This is not easy. But again, this is critically important, and I served in cultures, Indonesia, Ethiopia are two good examples of that, Laos, where people are not going to disagree with you. They're just going to kind of nod at you, and right away you begin to learn that that nod actually means no. Um, but you know, as Americans, we're not used to that. So again, I would say, and it, and imply, it, it conveys respect and empathy, which are absolutely critically important if your job, and your job as a diplomat is to persuade and to convince uh, you need to, you really need to, to hone on those skills. Um, Dean Shaw at American University calls this synthesis, a new way of tackling complex problems from seeming, seemingly opposite points of views. So I, I'll just leave, which what I think is the biggest challenge out there uh, for uh, all of our countries right now, and it's going to be uh, artificial intelligence. If we think uh, with, the, with what we've seen with the last election and with Brexit and others, you know, the workforce that really feels uh, that they've been left behind. Um, I can tell you if, if artificial intelligence moves as quick, quickly as I think it's going to be moving, we really are going to need to be able to help people adjust to that. I mean, there's still going to be a need for cross-cutting skills of human discernment and creativity. Um, um, that a ro robot can't approximate, but uh, many, many of the jobs are going to be uh, shifting in that direction. So with that, I'd love to, love to <laughs> answer questions, and, uh, and Ambassador Wayne, I'm sure, is also willing, and Ambassador Barton, and Tanya, I know you're also willing to talk about the commercial side if, if folks are interested. 
So I will ask the first question, sure. but someone who came from thinking Selectric two typewriters were the greatest thing since sliced bread. How about Blackberry and Wangs? Oh yeah. man, <laughs> graduate. Well, you don't even know those terms, so forget about that. The Wang. <laughs> That's right. Anyway, I get to ask the first question, sure. and I will. Think about what you'd like to ask. But we would like, I, you guys don't have to come up, but Ambassador Wayne, Ambassador Barton, in particular, yeah. uh, chime in, and, and you guys have a wealth of experience as well, so it should be a very interesting discussion. Could you talk a little bit about the relationship between the United States and the United Nations, and how well, I, I we should or should not um, Well, I actually, I think Ambassador Barton is a better place for this, because he actually served as an ambassador to the United Nations. Uh, I mean, critically important. Uh, it is. I, I'm a believer in the global institutions, and I do believe that the the uh, United Nations serves a real purpose. Um, I focus mainly in my career working with uh, UNDP, UNICEF, uh, all the the other yes. UN organizations in that area. And where they're they're critically important is they can bring so many of the partners together. Uh, you know, you can't, you can't do Iraq alone, you can't do Afghanistan alone. And I think the UN, uh, now they're, they've been criticized too, but I think generally they're seen as being nonpartisan and focusing, especially the work they've done on humanitarian issues. I think they really need to be commended, but I think Ambassador Barton can, can answer that, having served there. Rick? Well, let me just add a point. And I, sure. I, I really agree with that. And, and the, some, you go back a number of years to ni the late 1980s, and only, well, 1989, when Operation Lifeline Sudan mm -hmm. began. And mm -hmm. the United States was very involved in that. Mm -hmm. And we ran into a lot of sovereignty issues and all of that with the government of Sudan in that time. Yeah. But when the United Nations, Jim Grant, through mm -hmm. UNICEF, engaged, it got easier. Yeah. Yeah. And better. But they need to do away with that requirement that you actually have to declare, the government actually has to declare a disaster. Well, we actually yeah. did after that. that. Many I, governments, I was with the Ethiopia did not want to <laughs> declare. They were right in the middle of yeah. an election. In fact, they wouldn't even use the word cholera. Oh, yeah. Well, when I was in OFDA, mm -hmm. then the Sudan thing mm -hmm. was actually it. And nobody likes you to provide assistance to rebel areas. Mm -hmm. So that if you look at the legislation now, it's sort of a, will you, you request or will tolerate mm -hmm. international assistance. So mm -hmm. we fluff that Un one. Unfortunately, <laughs> I think for the, uh, the, the lines else. have been blurred and, and they have themselves become uh, victims of terrorist attacks. Uh, I was shortly after yeah. I, I was working on uh, Iraq and of course we all know Sergio uh, was, was uh, killed. Uh, yeah. Rick, Ambassador Barton. Well, first off, it's, it's great to be able to listen to you, Pat, since you've spent way too much time listening to me. So I'm going <laughs> so to really, this is, uh, yeah, sure. So, so that, this is going to be, I'm going to keep my interventions uh, uh, slim and none, if I could. But on the UN, I, I do think that uh, America first is starting to mean America alone. Yeah. And that's, yeah. most people don't think of, of loneliness as being a, a great strength. Um, and the UN works well when the members behave responsibly. And if you think that you've got a privileged membership position, which we do, we do in fact have one, but if you behave like it, then that diminishes the institution even further. And it has obviously served us served us very well. I think to its own detriment a little bit more recently because we do, we've been kind of monitoring their how how loyal is the body to us as opposed mm -hmm. to the people of the country or the problem that we're looking at. So um, that, but I think it's a, an invaluable institution. It's 70 years old. I'm almost 70 years old, showing a little bit of age. Uh, needs to probably be revived a bit, um, and so transfusions of energy and enthusiasm and of purpose are necessary when we've got great leaders at the UN, as we oftentimes do in various member agencies, they are very effective, and many of them are American because we give more money than anybody else, and so we then claim those positions, but uh, some of these entitlements have also started to undermine the, the value of the institution, so I think we've got quite a lot of rethinking to do. Tony, That's it. Would, would you like to, <laughs> no? Open it up. I'm sure no one here has a question. <laughs> yes, ma'am. 
It would be helpful if you Yeah, say who you them. are and where you're associated with so okay. they know here they're, they're talking to people. Uh, hi, my name is Katie Botto. I am currently not associated anywhere. I just got my master's degree on a Fulbright in Korea, and I'm about oh. to start a, a job at the Carnegie Endowment in a month. Oh, wonderful. Um, but for now, I'm just hanging out, coming to think tank events. <laughs> great, great. Um, but I have a question. So you spoke a lot about collaboration, which obviously is very important. And I'm wondering, you know, a lot of these careers in international affairs are so competitive, and people tend to be very career motivated, and these are very prestigious careers, and I think you encounter a lot of people who are very focused on that. And I was wondering if you ever found it difficult to create a collaborative environment in any of your careers because of something like that, or what other you know, barriers there were to collaboration? I, I think a, you know, a little bit of competition is good, and I think ambition is good, but I think my, the, what I was trying to say is, in fact, that won't get you very far. You can't uh, really be very effective uh, as, as just one single individual. I mean, you mentioned Korea. I can't think of, of, of a more challenging issue that requires some of the best minds and requires, in fact, a, a lot of um, different talents and skills. The, the State Department uh, actually, when they, you, they do your performance, uh, actually rates you on whether you can get along with people or not. So if you are blatantly ambitious to the detriment of other people, you're actually not going to get very far. And even worse, you'll get what's called a corridor reputation, uh, which, um, and you, you know, your reputation's the most critical thing, one of the most critical things that you have. So a little bit's okay, but uh, and p people recognize it. I, you know, I used to, I had a couple things I required when I would say to uh, my staff, and, and Tanya remembers this. Can you remember the three things, Tanya? Remember what one of them was? Well, it was no jerks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. <laughs> Tony. Sure. So as you're thinking about doing this, it, one of the hardest things to do within agencies and then across the U.S. government and then with allies and friends is actually to build trusting collaboration. Yeah. And even if we now rate people for their collaboration, we don't rate different bureaus for collaborating with each other within the yeah. State Department. Yeah. We don't rate state AID, DOD, the NSC for collaborating with each other. And in places overseas, wherever they may be, in Afghanistan, for example, uh, to our own fault, we don't collaborate enough with our allies, partners, military, civilian, and with the local government. Um, so it's always going to be a challenge. And that's why if you develop the skill to collaborate and then figure out the skills for bringing other people together to do that, it will really help you during your career and it will start being really appreciated within the organization in, with your, in which you're working, even if you have to overcome people's resistance to collaborating. Yeah. Yeah. So I think just well, keep we, that in uh, mind. Well, we, having spent um, a, a number of my assignments were what, what we called at the State Department functional bureaus, uh, uh, because the reputation in the department is that the regional bureaus reign supreme. So the only way, in fact, to break that is to come in with expertise, and I think we saw that with, with CSO, yeah. we see that with the Eco Economic and Commercial Bureau at State. Um, so I, I totally endorse, endor endorse what you're saying. And if I can just add, I was... Uh, and AIDs. Oh, well, yeah. Add a <laughs> but I was at a meeting here yesterday with the EU Commissioner on Humanitarian Assistance. And we have a bit of a tough time with the EU right now, given our administration. And it's very important on the humanitarian side, health issues, mm -hmm. uh, broader humanitarian issues, food issues, to work together. And that relationship is being maintained whether while you go up a level or move over to another issue, it's not so hot. So the ability to negotiate and understand each other's walk in their shoes a little bit mm -hmm. is really important, you know? Now, one of the things you hear a lot about now is you want to win. No, you want everybody to win. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then things work. Mm -hmm. anyway. Oh, 
You're a shy group. You've got quite a crowd here. Don't be shy. Well, I'll start going around the room calling on people. <laughs> well, yeah. That's just, uh, let me just remind you, Pat is very good at just pointing to people. <laughs> so be careful. Um, hi. Um, I'm Kyle, and I'm, inter I'm interning at International Law Institute right now. Um, you mentioned earlier that political economy was a relatively new subject when you were studying it. I was wondering what kind of new perspective did that sort of field bring to global development? And are there any new, uh, new topics or new uh, ways of thinking that contribute to global development uh, nowadays? Well, there's a, there's a whole lot of thinking out there. In fact, um, uh, both at Johns Hopkins and at Harvard, uh, I read two very interesting pieces in foreign policy where they talked about the um, benefits of getting a career in international affairs. And in fact, the whole focus was on what I was, was saying in my earlier remarks was on some of these global challenges and how we're going to address them. Uh, when I was at Columbia, it was actually Joan Spiro. I don't know if she was at, she started, I think, at LSE, but she was the one who sort of introduced this idea of political economy. It certainly has evolved. I mean, in those days, uh, people studied development, but people didn't study things like conflict prevention or conflict oh. mitigation or pe any of these, none of these topics. I mean, you could take a course on the United Nations, but we've come, come very, very far. Uh, I mean, I haven't, I haven't been in academia in many, many years, but just reading uh, Francis Gavin was, was one, of the, one of the authors of an excellent article. I, I highly recommend them. In fact, I'd be happy to share uh, Please just the, the, two, the two authors. They, they were talking about the need for, yeah. the need now more than ever uh, for people to be studying international affairs. Yes, I could, well, tell, uh, I could tell you have a brain. Up question. here <laughs> and then in the back. Start mm -hmm. a little. Mm -hmm. And by the way, I'm not only speaking about the United oh, States, you, because I don't know if, uh, if you, some of you may not be Americans, uh, may not be American citizens. This, everything I'm saying, I think, applies to every country, so yeah. even places like Russia and North Korea. Hi. Uh, standing up. Uh, my name is Jamie George. I'm also currently unaffiliated. I graduated from GW and then left the country for about seven years and just got back. Oh, where so were you? So a lot you? of your, oh, all over the place. Oh, oh. Um, Myanmar, France, South Sudan, Lebanon, and one more. Um, wow. <laughs> sorry. All the fun spots. Um, yeah. So because we're here today to talk about careers in international affairs, I'm wondering if you can speak to maybe how you got started in the field. And um, what was the first job that you got and sort of what were the experiences yeah. that you did in that first job to build up to some of these amazing experiences you now have? your name? Um, well, I, I did a junior year abroad in college, and that sort of sparked my interest in travel. So the idea that you could actually have a job and travel seemed to me fabulous. Uh, the j one job I didn't take, but I was, I was offered, was Peace Corps. And I do have to tell you, if I have one regret, is that I didn't uh, take that first assignment with the Peace Corps. And the reason being is my French would have been a lot better if I had taken, <laughs> was to teach uh, young students uh, English in Cote d'Ivoire. So, uh, so I highly recommend that when I was in Ethiopia, we had one of the largest uh, Peace Corps programs in the world. Rick can speak to the Peace Corps as well. He knows pe many people that were in that. Uh, and I think, B Bill, were you in the Peace Corps? Uh, no, many, they, they, most people they at AID were. Me. Oh, okay. Uh, but that's a, that's a great career. Uh, I actually, after I, I had an internship with the city of New York, when I was at Columbia, and I worked on an, uh, a project on a coal terminal and a grain terminal and trade issues, and I had specialized at Columbia in um, European uh, Union. It was the e e EEC in those days, and uh, I actually did my master's thesis on the common agricultural policy at the EEC. Not, not a, I, I, in fact, was just cleaning out my papers. Not exactly a riveting uh, piece of work, uh, but but uh, it did it did spark an interest in in agriculture. And I then worked for New York City for about two and a half years on a number of projects. Then I moved down to Washington, started with the Foreign Ag uh, Agricultural Service, and then shifted over to state. I went out as an agricultural attaché to India, and I could see the limits 
of uh, my ambition, actually, uh, with it, it wasn't going to get very far with with the Foreign Agriculture Service because I actually didn't have the the real agriculture background. I had more of the trade experience in that area. But I think the the point of uh, the, the, that I would also like to make is you, you sort of think you have, it's always good to have a path and it's good to have a plan, uh, but you also then have to be open to the fact that you may get offered something that's going to completely shift you in a different direction. So here I had all this experience, well, you know, Europe, I had a certificate in Europe, Europe and, you know, I thought, you know, of course, Europe, France, Italy, I'd studied in Italy, uh, and then my first assignment was India. So, uh, you know, and then I spent a lot of my career in South Asia, Southeast Asia, and more recently, uh, and I did two tours in Africa. So you just kind of, you, you, I wouldn't be all over the place, but um, you also want to be open <laughs> to uh, a lot of different opportunities that might come your way. And I would just add, I was talking to somebody before, mm -hmm. um, I was going to be a history professor. Latin American history was my thing. Uh, I ended up working for a congressman in the House Foreign Affairs Committee for a couple of years. He lost his election. I lost my job. I ended up in the Foreign Service. <laughs> and uh, never, never entered my mind my entire career. And I'll bet Rick and Tony may have had similar sorts of experience. It's amazing to the number of people who we talk to who say, well, it didn't, didn't work out the way I planned. Don't plan so much. Well, I only actually served in Europe once. And it was working for uh, <laughs> Ambassador Wayne when he was uh, at, at our, our mission there. So, but in that job, I actually was working on the uh, assistance of the Group of 24, and uh, in those we were going through the Rwanda uh, crisis in those days. So I worked actually very closely with the, the Europeans on uh, the situation uh, there. So, you know, you just, you know, just be open to it. I, I guess it's, and it's yeah. a great career. I mean, it, it's a lot of fun because you never know what you're going to be doing next. Well, I, I, I shifted from the Foreign Agricultural Service to the State Department under something that was called the Mid-Level Entry Program. And they have the program and then they cancel the, and so I, you know, the other great program is the PMI program. Uh, or is it, what's it, or PM, yeah. Presidential Management Inter Fellows, PMF. Fellows. Program, yeah, that's another great program because you can get you get an agency to sponsor you, but then you can sample and taste other agencies. So I think it's a it's a great. It's One a of the poster childs for that is Kelly Clements, oh. who came in that way. She's the deputy high commissioner for refugees right now. Yes, that's right. Uh -huh. She was working for PRM. Mm -hmm. In the back. No, you my question. Oh. <laughs> who else? I can't believe you don't have other yes, questions. Yes, gentlemen. Yes. Otherwise, I got a bundle to Oh, ask, okay. So okay. not to worry. Uh, hi. My name is Max Dowd, and I'm interning with the McCain Institute right now. Uh -huh. And uh, there's been a lot of talk recently about how China, particularly Chinese foreign policy, is able to be a lot more long-term focused than countries like the United States because of their position as a one-party state. They don't have to worry about administrations changing every few years. I was wondering from uh, any of your experiences as diplomats, how does a diplomat from a country, you know, like a Western democracy, navigate those politically dynamic waters to keep that long-term scope and that long-term vision for uh, development? Well, I can tell you they were certainly trying to beat us in Africa and on the commercial and trade side. And Tanya and I <laughs> worked actually on a case. It took us a year to, uh, we were trying to help an American company that was facing some very stiff and very unfair uh, Chinese competition. But I'll tell you, they put everything behind it. They now have more commercial representation worldwide than we do. I, I looked at a map, we were, looking, we were plotting all our, our foreign commercial, it, we have the Foreign Commercial Service and the Foreign Ag Service overseas, in addition to AID, the foreign affairs agencies. Uh, but then in area, in almost every economic and commercial section, um, uh, you know, focuses, they focus very, very heavily on commercial issues. So we have, even if we don't have a foreign commercial service person, we have people that carry uh, and do that work overseas. So even if you add all of those and you look on a map and you look at the Chinese and they put everything 
behind it. And I'll tell you, they don't necessarily play fair. And you have to be very, very diligent. And, um, and then what you need to do in that case, in this case it was working with the Ethiopian government, was we were trying to explain to them, you know, they kept saying they wanted U.S. investment, you know, because it was still viewed as quality. Uh, compared sometimes to Chinese investment. And we were saying if, if that, th this company that had actually been operating in the country were to lose this tender, unfairly, they had the lowest, the lowest bid and they were the most high quality, uh, that this would be very detrimental to the government's goals to try to encourage uh, U.S. Uh, in, investment in, in, in Ethiopia. But, uh, you know, you have to put the people out there. Uh, you know, you cannot monitor this from the United States. You've got to have people in the field, people on the ground, what Tony was saying, building the relationships. You have to know who the people are uh, and build trust. Uh, and that it can only be done in person. So I, uh, Tony and I and, 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 and Bill, we've all been participating in something called American Diplomacy at Risk. And in fact, uh, Tony moderated the panel on the need for our economic and commercial presence, as well as our uh, USAID uh, presence overseas. Tony, yeah. Mm -hmm. You are right that sometimes as a country we are at a disadvantage because we do change every few years our foreign policy. So as a participant in that, if you're in one agency or another, um, you do need to keep thinking strategically and present a good reason why you should do certain different things. And you have to base that in what our national interests are. So you may have to sell it a few times. It's not bad because you get, you get new people coming in and you get other ideas on how to do things. Um, but as Pat was saying, basically in the United States, we've reduced the amount of money we've spent on core diplomatic capacity since 2008. It's a pretty sta steady reduction. The Chinese have been increasing yeah. their spending yeah. on uh, d diplomatic capacity, which includes commercial, but other types of commercial, uh, I mean other types of diplomatic activity in that same period of time. And you can see this if you get, go and look at one of the graphic maps on countries that have the United States as their first trading partner or China yeah. as their first trading partner and the difference between 2000 and 2000 and now close to us. So you will see it's amazing. We are now, um, we were a major. we had a, a relationship with a majority of countries where we were their largest trading partner. We now are a very small part of that. And you see it in various areas. The Foreign Commercial Service, for example, has not grown and the current administration is proposing to close 30 some posts of the Foreign Commercial Service around the world at the same time that they're saying it's really important that we sell things overseas and do yeah. things. Yeah. So they're reducing the presence. So you do have to face those kind of challenges that the Chinese don't face as often. We try to make, we make up for it with innovation and creativity and, and energy. Um, but it's a, it's a tough row to hoe. And it was a very good question. And by being, uh, having a good trade relationship, that brings a lot of benefits in other areas when you're looking for a cooperation with the government in other areas. Uh, so it's not just, it's not just the, the, the monetary benefits that come with building that kind of a relationship. And if I could just sort of add, it sort of this uh, follows on, just the, the general relationship between the diplomatic community and the private sector. The United States has an enormous convening power to pull people together mm -hmm. and get people to talk about issues. And the role we play that way has, you know, a, a dramatic impact on the United States, of course, and the United States private factor, private sector, but on international growth in general. Yeah. And, and, and it's critically important in areas like intellectual property and all, you can think of a whole host of areas where we want to make sure that the governments have the, sort of a, a fair set of policies out there. And um, that's the other area where our, our economic officers and others, and yes. in fact, USAID and the economic development area, training, 
bringing people to the United States, exposing them to the way we do business, uh, encouraging them to follow the uh, OECD, again, World uh, Trade Organization. They're so, so absolutely critically important. Um, one example that was given to me, because we in fact also need to be involved, this is back to your question on the UN, we mm -hmm. need to be involved with uh, many of these organizations. And one is the case, was brought to me by companies, our, many of our, our companies that work in the health area, it was the World uh, Health Organization. Mm -hmm. Because in fact, many of the policies that the World Health Organization uh, was uh, were, uh, that they were considering, and many of them were actually detrimental to uh, to our private sector. So, in fact, yeah. that's an area. And it's not just helping them with their exports, uh, companies with their exports. It's not just helping with investment. It's also making sure, in the case again, I'm going to I'll use Ethiopia as an example, that they don't put in laws that restrict um, importing uh, U.S. cotton because it happens to be, uh, you know genetically modified. So I picked that one because you don't, you don't eat cotton. Yeah. And I know people have, people can get very emotional about that particular <laughs> issue. Because <laughs> right. one thing I'd like to raise, and you two in particular uh, have been very involved in this, is we see the rising importance, whether we like it or not, of fragile states. Oh. And whether it's urbanization, population growth, we see if you put all these things together, migration, and migration happens not just with people, with bats, rats, mosquitoes, and, tack, and, and ticks, and they come together and you see a place like the DRC, mm -hmm. uh, which I, is personally important to me, has a little bit of an outbreak now with Ebola, yeah. and they do not have the capacity to deal with this. So one of the worst, the, the fragile states is a continuum. You have mm -hmm. fragile to failed, and they're kind of moving real close to the failed side. Mm -hmm. And that infects and affects all of us. And then we can uh, add the next, the, the next step that becomes not only a fragile and a failed state, it becomes a state that then becomes uh, a, a convenient location for terrorists. So, I mean, yes. Afghanistan is a perfect example, but what we see this, we see this world, worldwide, uh, a, a failed state, and you mentioned South Sudan. Oh, yep. That's pretty close to a failed state. It's not just the refugees. Oh, no, it, it's, it's all. And, uh, you know, the cost of that, we all bear the cost of that. So, Rick, maybe, I mean, you, you actually, your upcoming book is, addresses this issue. <laughs> but I, it, but <laughs> I am, I am on the right here. Right here. <laughs> but if you no, please here. Oh yeah, you do. Okay. Actually, we're recording. This is live, right? Oh, so okay. people are seeing this. So this is a question I'd like to ask Ambassador Hatchlack because I think it will be very useful for um, everyone in the room, but especially women. So can you talk a little bit about mentorship um, at the senior level for women in the service? And what are some of the things that can be done? And um, it's not to put you on the spot because I think you have done this very well. Well, I, I mentioned gender as one of our one of the, the challenges, and I think that President Obama was said, you know, you don't want to field half a team. So I think it, you know, the economic benefits, and the World Bank has done studies on this, of having uh, women fully engaged is, is critically important. But that includes being fully engaged uh, in the State Department and AID and FCS and other agencies. And I've always. Um, it, always sought out mentors and always wanted to, to mentor. Uh, in fact, um, women don't have to mentor women. Some of the best mentors out there that I've had have actually been men. Um, and it's, it's really to, the purpose of a, a mentor is to sort of help you navigate in a way and to sort of point out to you what some of the opportunities and things are out there that you may not be able to see because you know you're only coming you're coming from a less experienced perhaps a, a more narrow uh, perspective um, but I would also say some of the most rewarding work that I've done in the development area has been actually in the area of uh, gender is working with yeah. with women women farmers uh, and things like that Big it's been time. really yeah. really fabulous so great 
Uh, Rick? You don't have to study gender studies. To well, this that didn't, just, that just didn't a, exist when I was in school either. This, this, <laughs> there's an ad for a, a moment from the other side. <laughs> One of my major mentors was a woman, Julie oh. Taft. <laughs> so, uh, exactly. I think this is something that Pat really did extremely well. And uh, when she, when we worked together, and and people of men and women really went to Pat for the very practical coaching. <laughs> and there's a, there's a wonderful uh, Harvard surgeon who writes for the New Yorker frequently, and he's got a, did a terrific piece on coaching, and he didn't really think much about coaching. He's a surgeon, successful, and then he thought his career was getting flat. And so he thought maybe he should invite somebody in to observe his surgery, because he wasn't sure he was improving any longer. And, at, and he quickly recognized there were a lot of things he could do, could do better because his former surgery professor had taken notes throughout a very successful operation and then told him how he could do it better. But the thing I loved about it was that he, he was a tennis fan and he, and he recognized that the very best player in the world, Rafael Nadal, had a coach with him all the time. Now Nadal could only improve this much and the rest of us who could improve don't have, don't do it, take any coaching at all. So I, we clearly need it and need it all the time. And, and it's uh, something you should seek and should look for organizations that actually provide it more aggressively. I think it's an area the State Department could formalize more and the yeah. United Nations could certainly formalize yeah. a lot more. It's talked about, but people tend to find, have to find their own way. They have to. Well, it's also, I think people tend to look at it as a one way sort of relationship. It's actually a two way relationship. In fact, you can get just as much out of the person you're mentoring as you can, as they can get from you. And what you can often get from somebody you're mentoring is because they are usually, uh, you know, more junior, and they're more in touch. The, the higher up you go, the less people actually want to tell you what's actually going on in an organization. So I, 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 I think sometimes mentoring is a good way to find out what's going on. True. <laughs> Force that quickly. Just that my wife uh, often says the reason that we ask children what are, what do you want to do when you grow up is because we're looking for ideas. <laughs> <laughs> there was someone in the back here. Yeah. Otherwise, ask about NGOs. Uh, oh, Kylanus okay. Georgetown University. Um, thank Speak you. Speak up a little bit. Sure, sure. Um, so, thank you for your speech. Uh, one of the things I've been really struck by is it seems that while you know, America First makes America lonely, how do we change the narrative? How do we start to engage people and collaborate with people across the country so that they appreciate the work that people like the State Department do and they start to reflect that when they vote and they start to support organizations like Exim Bank and OPEC and so well, forth? Well, you know, I've never quite understood why there's such an emphasis on America first. Of course, you're overseas as a diplomat, you're representing the United States. Who else are you representing? So I, I, got, I got very confused by this when people were, well, the State Department doesn't stand for America first. That's exactly what we do. I mean, we are there to That's represent American <laughs> interests. And, but you're not gonna get very far if you come marching into a room saying, it's just what we want, okay? It's all zero sum, and we have to be the winner here. Well, how, how many people are gonna cooperate with you? And again, these problems are not solvable by one country. We are in a global world. Looking only at uh, a trade deficit figure uh, on, in the, on the manufacturing side doesn't take into account that perhaps maybe we have an enormous surplus on the services side, banking, tourism, uh, you know, selling of military equipment, et cetera. So I, again, people need to, to be, I don't think we, we do a good job of, of explaining uh, the benefits of diplomacy. Um, I think because we don't have an active constituency, I mean, it's not like the Department of Agriculture who has farmers. Uh, uh, the Department of Commerce, who has American companies that produce something. We have think um, tanks. Yeah, we have <laughs> think tanks. <laughs> uh, so we've, we've never been good at the, we, the State Department, sp sp we spent a lot of our career look, going into a country, learning about a country, focusing on the country where we're, we're being assigned. We don't think, we didn't think that we had to 
come back and explain to everybody here what we were doing. Uh, they did start a program a number of years ago called Hometown Diplomats. We have put diplomats in universities and things like that. We do encourage people to take internships and we do bring uh, groups into the State Department and others. So I think we're trying to do a, a better job at this, um, but uh, I probably could do, could do a little bit better work. And it's, it's really tricky on the foreign assistance side. When you, I come from Western Michigan, yeah. where nobody pays much attention to anything out of Western Michigan. And uh, I know my mother said, I, got, I joined the Foreign Service, and she said, why couldn't you be a teacher or a lawyer or a minister? I could tell people what you do. I have no <laughs> idea. And I got assigned overseas, and she said, what did you do wrong? <laughs> so but, that's, but it's, the, it's a big... <laughs> there's also this, it's, you know, all the misinformation out there. I mean, if you have to stop an average, not so much in Washington, D.C., but if you stop somebody... Oh, yeah. in Michigan and say, how much is the U.S. government spending on diplomacy? Uh, you know, it's, it's minimal. And how much is the U.S. government spending on development? And by the way, development, everybody rises with development, right? Economic prosperity, more markets for U.S. goods, if we want to just be craven yeah. about it. Um, you know, but uh, it, it, it ultimately benefits us in, in oh, the yeah. end. And you don't have a failed state. And you don't have refugees flooding across the border. Well, there's a whole other issue I won't get into here, but did you have? I, I did, yes. Yeah. Yes, he has a question. Hi, um, I'm an intern up on the fourth, fourth floor here. Uh, my name's Ben. I'm a, I really want, want to go back to your point where you said about collaboration and things like that. And um, I'm double majoring in political science and urban planning. Oh, um, great. And I started my career as a computer scientist. That didn't last very long. But, um, uh, I, but I do That'll see... That'll come in handy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> but what I've been seeing, especially at a university like Virginia Tech, where we have 10, 000, nearly 10,000 engineers, um, is a lot of people getting shying away from going into the government work, even as an engineer, because there still is that work there. Uh, because they don't think they really have a spot to make progress. They think stuff will get tied down, their work will get tied down. And you said you felt uncomfortable out in Silicon Valley, but that really is the future of the workplace, yeah, yeah, is that yeah. open sense. Um, but I really don't ever see Congress going into an open workplace um, like that. So I was wondering if you had any uh, ideas or solutions towards that end, because, um, I mean, there's talent everywhere. I mean, we're in a generation where everyone goes to school. One of the um, initiatives uh, under Secretary Kerry was actually to place um, put some diplomats into Silicon Valley to actually work, uh, work with the tech companies out there. Um, the, the other is, on, in the Economic and Commercial Bureau at State, we have a whole, I mean, you, don't, you think only of the State Department of people that sort of have political science or history or law or those types of degrees. In fact, in the economic uh, unit that I was working in, we had people, engineers, if you're gonna do telecommunications or you're gonna do space issues or, you're going to do defense issues. Uh, yeah, you need. It's very, very helpful to have people that actually have some technical background. And again, we get back to you want to build the strongest team. And the team, if everybody has the same skill set you have, you're not going to get very far. So, engineers. I think the State Department would welcome a couple, yeah. couple engineers. AID mm -hmm. used to have a pile of engineers. I think when I left yeah. here, they're down yeah. to two, yeah. and that's a horrible. No, and I think you were talking about working with NGOs and we were working on uh, water issues related to the refugees that were, had come from South Sudan into to Ethiopia and the International Rescue Committee. Uh, people, there, <coughs> men, much of the work they do is related actually to water supply and engineering and pipes and electricity, you know, very smart sort of, a, yeah. yeah. So, you know, fabulous, uh, fabulous I, solutions to, to real problems. And if I could just throw in here, it's sort of one of my issues is, because I never did it through my career and it's driven me nuts the whole time. To, we need more MBAs. You need doctors, you need nurses, you need epidemiologists, you can find them by the dozen. But the management, to manage and run organizations, that's in short supply. Uh, in a lot of places. So we've always sort of, if you go back a bunch of years, made it just, you went to business, you got an MBA, and then you got other degrees for the international stuff. Don't separate them. 
The, They're really important. That's, that's an important point because increasingly at our embassies overseas, we will have representatives from the Center for Disease Control or uh, you know the Drug Enforcement Agency, a whole host yeah. of different government agencies that are not international affairs agencies, uh, foreign affairs agencies, and making sure that those agencies too know how to work within a sort of an embassy in a diplomatic situation is critically important. Yes. CDC has grown uh, oh. has an enormous presence overseas now. True. Mm -hmm. Tony? I think more than if it's in the public sector or the private sector, what's key is if you have yeah. good leadership. Mm -hmm. And yeah. one of my favorite books is Good to Great, which is a book written about businesses and distinguishes what are the best businesses and why are they good and why did they continue being mm -hmm. good businesses. It's, it's a great author and I recommend all his books. And I've applied all of them to the public service, which you can do. Mm -hmm. You do need good managers, but there are also a bunch of uh, private sector companies out there that are poorly managed that you would not want to work in and that squash creativity and get and mm -hmm. even if they make a lot of money initially, they then fall very quickly. Mm -hmm. So it, it really is, do you have good leadership and a good system of good collaboration? Do you get the right people on the bus? Do you keep them there? Um, do you focus on what you're producing, who your clients are, and go for the best value for, for that, those clients out there? And that applies to both public service and private. So as you're looking at that, two things, it's really good to know those other good examples, apply them wherever you're going to go, but also look at the organization you're going into and are they using these good practices? Where if, it, if it's a private sector, if it's an NGO, um, or if it's in the public sector. And that really makes a big difference about what you can accomplish wherever you are. Final question. I'm, I'm conscious of everybody's time, so there's a gentleman back there who has a question. And then I would like to give a heads up. <laughs> I feel like Dan Rundy here. I'm going to ask Tony <laughs> and Rick and Pat if you have any final comments. Yeah, I'm and then we're done. Because yeah. yeah. I know everybody's uh, trying to get out of town uh, for the weekend. Go ahead. Thank you. My name is uh, Nicolas Shah. I, I work for the, uh, as a consultant for the IOM. Uh, my question was about you were talking in your presentation about how many and trust, and I was wondering about the current harmony, absence of harmony currently between the White House and the State Department, and the, you know, the multiple contradictions that exist between what your president says and what the State Department says, and, and how it is to, my question is how it is today to work for the State Department when there doesn't seem to be trust between the White House and the State Department, and the trust between your president and the State Department, when recently the, 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 the ambassador to the UN was contradicted, mm -hmm. apparently got confused about you know, different issues regarding re Russian uh, sanctions. So how it is today to be a state of official, work for the State Department, when your current president is currently you know, untrusty of your work and what you do? Thank you. Well, that's a, that's a good question. I left at the end of November, so I haven't <laughs> been uh, working on uh, some of the more, more recent issues, but uh, there are a number of State Department positions in the White House, at a staff, staff level positions. And uh, when I left, we were, uh, actually my chief of staff went over and worked on the, some of the economic uh, issues. Uh, we have been, um, we, in, I would encourage State Department people to fill those positions because it's critically important that the folks that are doing, uh, providing the, the information, um, are, you know, uh, have the information, I mean, as opposed to just sort of a one-sided view. We, we, I use the issue of trade deficits for a specific reason. Um, you know, the, Tony can maybe speak to this with regard to NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement. We, the State Department is one of the partners with U.S. Trade Representative's Office, Department of Commerce, and others working on that agreement and working <coughs> with the White House. And it, it's really critically important that, uh, and the team at the State Department that, that has been working on this issue. Actually, were, many of them worked on the original NAFTA. And so uh, there are many chapters to a trade agreement. Uh, they're very, very detailed. Uh, and it's, uh, so it's, it's, it's really important. Um, I, I've heard, I've not been in the department since the new secretary has arrived, but I've heard that morale has picked up a bit. I don't know if others are hearing that, but um, 
Uh, I did hear that uh, the secretary seems to want to engage uh, with the folks uh, in, in the department. Your people are your best resource, so I can't imagine why you'd go into an organization and alienate your people. To me, that seems, uh, Tony was talking about why co companies fail. Uh, no. there, there's a reason for that. <laughs> so I'll, I'll leave it at that. I don't really have anything more current to say. Okay, I would like to give Rick or Tony and Tony, a final comment. Maybe Rick first, because he's Yeah, Rick first. Yeah. Tony, and then you get the last word. Oh, good goodness. <laughs> and you can say anything you want. No one can ask you questions. OK, then. OK, OK. Well, well, really, just again, it's, it's great to be able to hear both of you, because I worked with Bill and actually tried to copy Bill. Uh, <laughs> he was uh, the number two at OFDA, which is the Office of Foreign Disaster Assistance, when I was starting the Office of Transition Initiatives at AID. And we copied as freely as we were as we could, so uh, from what they were doing, and learned a lot from them. Uh, just to pick up quickly on one thing that Tony said, that uh, I saw in, in social media a few weeks ago these numbers: 14, 18, 20, 22. And what they what they happened to be was the length of time <clears throat> that the average employee spends at. Uh, uh, the four largest employers in Silicon Valley. So Facebook is 22 months, and the shortest was uh, not Lyft, but the other guys, uh, Uber. Uber. So they were 14 months, and in between were, were the other, were Google and whatnot. So now it's really hard. I, one of the criticisms I have of the State Department is that the rotation model had, needs to be rethought uh, in a rather significant way because we get people in places just long enough to figure out what's going on and then we're moving them out and then and there are other complications. But I do think that the points about leadership, the points about followership and then how do you create an egalitarian environment are really important and uh, everybody's spoken to those. Great. Tony. Well, thank you very much for this sure. generous <laughs> opportunity, as well as your great statements. So I would say one of the things as you're thinking about this, to go off your last question and to go back to what we were talking about, <clears throat> is really to know about the history of institutions that you're going to work in. I had the pleasure of teaching a course up at Hamilton on the history of national security de uh, decision making in the United States from World War II forward. And you can just see the patterns of what worked well what administrations was this fighting, infighting cut down, and how did they deal with it? You always disagree on issues, but how can you do that constructively? And there are a lot of good lessons from just knowing that history when you go in to work in a place. And whether you want to work at AID, then you look at the history of various uh, AID and development agencies around the world, or the UN, where, when has it worked better and why? And to just know that and to have that in your head, sort of this idea of what models really can help an organization. Because one of the key things to remember is that leadership is helping an organization work through change in a, in a positive direction. You can do that wherever you are in the organization. Yeah. So you can change organizations even at the entry level. You can be a leader in that organization. But you have to have in your thought, what are some things that work? And, and then look for opportunities to, uh, to employ those and deploy them and build networks and change things for good. And so I, I just wish you the best in wherever you get taken yeah. first and next. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I would just say it's a great career and the four of us are near, you know, we are, I'm retired, just retired and uh, we're, we're nearing the end uh, and it's your turn. <laughs> And, yeah, I wouldn't uh, say it quite like and that. I, 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 no, but I would. I, 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 I'm saying it for saying it for a reason because so often, uh, two things that that probably set me off. One is when people don't vote. That really sets me off, and that's yeah. not just Americans. In fact, in the recent Iraqi election, they only had a 44 percent turnout. Uh, you have to. You have to. I, we have, we are a great country. And we are a free country, and when you see, when you live in countries where people aren't free, uh, you, you I, I, to me, I, this is just something I think you need to uh, express your, or, or, or don't, then don't complain. 
and the other is walking around with sort of a, a bag full of complaints and it's this person's fault or it's this a co a country's fault or you know the Chinese did this to us or whatever. No, no. these are challenges that we all have to work on together and it's fun and it's rewarding and it, you're not always going to get exactly what you want. It's not a zero-sum gain. Again, we all we all w will rise if we if we can solve solve these problems. So, I'm happy to to pass the plate. <laughs> Please join me in thanking Pat and our colleagues here for being here today. Thanks. Thanks. Great. Great. Love to. Good. That's really well. Hmm? And we have about 400.